Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and I can hardly believe that it's been all of two and a half years now since I last called to grace this table upon my Midwestern ministerial friend, Dr. James Wall, longtime editor of the distinguished National Journal of Opinion, The Christian Century, and now its senior contributing editor. It's not exactly that every so often I've wanted my guest to give us this day our occasional religious fix on the open mind, but something like that, because Jim Wall has always so wisely and so well related himself to contemporary issues from the perspective of a profoundly religious sensibility and sensitivity that, to be blunt, is comparatively rare in America's more intellectual precincts. Usually, of course, Dr. Wall does that along with some kind of a mischievous slap at America's mass media. So what a delightful surprise it was to read recently his glowing Christian Century tribute to my favorite program, Entertainment Television's award-winning The West Wing, for taking God so seriously, as he wrote, quote, that it came as a shock when President Josiah Bartlett orders his Secret Service detail to block all entrances to the National Cathedral so that he might have a little one-on-one -on -one with the Lord." End quote. Question then, has Jim Wall or American television gone soft in the head or taken some kind of existential turn in the road? You, Dr. Wall, or television? I'm afraid television has not done that because it is very rare, as I said in my column, for theology to be treated so seriously and with such depth that I had to call attention to it, as it was on this uh, show. And you think this was in-depth treatment? Uh, to me, it's one of those rare moments in entertainment television where you have a willingness on the part of the program, the scriptwriters, the producers, and the performers to grapple with a theological issue and to do it with honesty and integrity because this was a great moment in television history where the president uh, had an argument, an angry exchange with God about something that had happened that he deeply disapproved of. And? Well, it, it allowed the viewer, it allowed the viewer to say, yes, that's what it is when someone like Mrs. Landingham dies suddenly without any explanation, without any cause, just a freak automobile accident and takes her out of his life. Other things were happening to him in this particular episode in his ongoing uh, series, but this one really triggered him. So when he got to the church, he went through the funeral service and then he ordered, as you say, quoting me, uh, to close it down. I've got to have a conversation with God. And there he is in this wonderfully ph photographed uh, segment. Secret Service standing off to the side, immobile, quiet, and he's talking to God. And, and what they did in this moment was so unique, I think. They used Latin. They allowed the president to speak in Latin because he's a Catholic and um, the service had been Catholic, at least in, in tradition. And uh, we don't see the subtitles. There are no subtitles. And it's only after the program is over that we were able to find out what he was saying. But you knew it was roughly an argument uh, with God, and that's what he was saying. And enough English came through that you knew what he was trying to say to God, and the Latin just strengthens the whole thing about it. This is not good. You have no right to do that. You have no right to treat me this way, to treat us this way, to treat her that way. I'm angry with you about that. 
Now, aren't there those who might consider this profane? Oh, no. Oh, no. The, the biblical record is clear on this point of uh, deeply believing people, uh, Job being the classic example of anger at God. Um, somebody that says, why are you doing this to me? And uh, you, you get the, uh, after all, what do we know about God other than personal experience and tradition and scripture, whatever tradition we are part of? And in this instance, uh, we don't have scripture, but we have the traditional understanding of our right to say to God, this is not good. Something has happened to this person we all love, and, and this is not the way it should happen. Why do you let this happen? Well, of course, we always ask that question when someone dies so unexpectedly and younger than they should be when they die. Why? Why did this happen? And we don't have an answer, but we have to grapple with it. And the, the way we grapple with it is to go through the first phase of anger at the fact that it did happen. Well, Dr. Wall, you and I have spoken many, many times about the media. You've always been critical. Why has this occurred now? I don't know. I would attribute it to the people who are in charge of the program. Uh, it's a wonderful program. It's my favorite as it is yours. Mostly dealing with political issues, uh, strategy issues. When uh, one of the producers, Pat Goodell, writes the script, it usually deals with polling because that's his tradition. But in this instance, someone, I, I don't have the answers to who was behind it, decided to get involved in a theological argument. And it was the last program of, uh, of the last season it will be the first program, uh, the last one just before the new season starts, when we find out whether the president will run for re-election or not. I got a feeling he probably will. And it was just a rare moment in television history when the program creative people said, let's get into this subject. Wait a minute, Jim. The program creative people undoubtedly said that. Yeah. And these are brilliant yeah. young writers yeah. Yeah. and producer and the director, etc. But certainly it was vetted, well vetted, by the very network executives you have <laughs> so frequently yeah. taken off after, so that they have accepted In something this, as rare yeah. and even as raw as this. In this instance, in, in this instance, you're right, they vetted it. They had to. But my guess is they, they all ask the same question. What group would be mad at us for doing this? Who among our listeners would be offended by us having this kind of anger displayed toward God? And the vetting people must have decided that it wasn't enough negative so they could get away with it. Do you think they have? Do you think this will lead to more serious religion-tinged drama? I would hope drama? so. I would hope so. But it has to be in the context of the drama itself. Now, we have other programs, uh, various uh, type programs dealing with the police, dealing with law, dealing with crime, where people are sometimes frustratedly go to see a priest and say, what happened? What can I do about this? It, it, it figures into some storylines, not nearly as much as it should, because if television is going to reflect real life, and not this terrible thing we call real life television, which is atrocious, but if it's going to deal with real life, I've always argued that it should deal more with the normal way people proceed. So when they face tragedy, they're going to turn to God, many, if not most people, whatever way they define God, and say, why did this happen and how can I get through it? And we then are in a position, if television wants to be really honest, of saying, uh, here's how you get through it. You, sustain, you are sustained by the belief you have in the divine being that is your belief system. Well, how fares the rest of America's media when it comes to the question that you've always dealt with here? The refusal, the inability mm -hmm. to bring a religious sensibility to bear on the tales that are told. Well, um, unfortunately, secular television and secular media uh, plays to the profit line, the bottom line. And the fear is that if they show too much of one kind of religious interpretation, they will offend other parts of the religious community. So they play it safe and leave it out altogether. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I don't understand that. You've spoken before not about uh, 
not about programs about religion. Mm -hmm. but you've spoken about the media. Let's not just talk about programs, about the media and a religious sensitivity or sensibility. And uh, the question of uh, what a telev television rating expert says about how many people will be offended mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. how many will not be really doesn't enter into it, uh, does it? You, you've said that these secular people, uh, these people themselves have no sense and therefore no sensibility concerning you know, religious if, if I said that over the last many years that we've been doing this, uh, I'm, I'm beginning to adjust a little bit. And let me confess to you what that means. I'm confessing and adjusting to the fact that um, religious sensibility is certainly present in a large number of people who participate in this media, a lot of them. They, however, cannot get across their vision without having it, as you put it, vetted through the uh, screens of uh, producers and profit-oriented uh, sponsors. The bosses. What's that? The bosses, the bosses, the people who call the shots. And I don't, I've never felt that was an anti-religious feeling. I've always felt it was just a fear of offending too many people. Oh, Jim, 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 I could go back to transcript after transcript, <laughs> I think, and find that uh, you expressed, at any rate, the conviction that this was an anti-religious feeling. When we spoke about political leaders who had the sensitivity, talking mm -hmm. about Jimmy Carter, for instance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you felt that there was um, a, a kind of joint down on Carter because right. Let, of this. Let's see if we can make this distinction. There, there was a real serious down on Carter because of his uh, religious conviction, and uh, it took a long time for the secular media to get over that, and they really haven't gotten over it. They still somewhat disdain, uh, even when he's doing, doing so many great things as a private citizen, former president. Um, I think the distinction is, if I can be clear about this, is that the, uh, the, the, the dislike for certain kinds of religion, and in his case, a traditional Southern pietistic uh, evangelical religion, not fundamentalist. We've made this distinction before evangelical religion that uh, is more open to speaking about one's faith. The extreme example would be somebody willing to, to say um, they won a ball game because God helped them win it. And that offends people because they don't believe it. And immediately would say, how about the other team? I mean, the, the kind of prejudice against people whose faith calls upon them to testify to that fact. Now, there is a prejudice there. There is a dislike there from the secular media. But there is not a prejudice against grappling with religious issues if they knew how to do it. It takes creativity to do that, as was the example of uh, West Wayne, because those are the issues we all grapple with. We come up with different answers out of our tradition or our lack of tradition, out of our despair over what happens to us, or out of our hope in spite of despair of what's happened to us. So that's the distinction. Perhaps we should clarify it by saying the hostility is aimed at the institutionalized versions of religion that the secular media resents and dislikes. You, you don't see much attack on institutionalized um, religions that have uh, clearly identifiable uh, ways of expressing themselves. Roman Catholic, the, the Catholic tradition, for example, the more orthodox Judaism, for example, these, these are, and, and Islam, for example, in its religious expression, leaving out anything about the politics. Uh, these are overt expressions of religious uh, feelings shown in outward and visible signs of attire, of ritual. Hence, every Christmas you can usually find one or two networks willing to uh, put on a, a, an actual worship service at Christmas. Um, even perhaps some high holy days of uh, Judaism will occasionally be shown. Those are outward signs, and th those, those religious institution groups that have clearly identifiable outward signs, like a Catholic uh, mass, uh, or like a uh, Islamic uh, worship uh, where three times a day or five times a day prayers take place, and toward Mecca, um, these are overt signs that they can show. Now, I will say that in the past um, 10 to 15 years, there's been a greater willingness to treat those things seriously than there used to be. It used to be 
easy to make fun of, um, of religious people, even in those settings. But I think we're changing in that regard. So I have a positive report to give on media about the outward invisible signs. What they can't grapple with are the inward and spiritual feelings of people like Jimmy Carter, who, can't, uh, who don't have a, a worship experience that they can show us, they only have testimony. And testimony is disliked by the uh, media. Disliked or not understood? Uh, perhaps it's the same thing. And Al Gore and Bill Clinton and George Bush? They don't testify the way Carter does. They, they don't say, uh, I'm... And, and we know that. The public knows that. The public knows that all three of these men who happen to be... Um, well, let's see, um, uh, Clinton and Gore are uh, Southern Baptist in background. Bush is currently Methodist. Um, they don't testify to their faith the way Jimmy Carter did, and, uh, and nor are they part of a service-oriented uh, community that does things that are easily identifiable, such as John Kennedy would go to church in his Catholic church, and if cameras were allowed inside the worship, they would see a mass. You don't see that much. Bill, Bill Clinton, of course, was a master at, at being a pastor to the country when there was deep tragedy. He was there speaking. He was there identifying with, with the uh, public through their suffering experiences. And that came out of his background. But notice, he was at his best when dealing with grief, when dealing with tragedy, American-wide tragedy, the destruction of uh, the school out in Oklahoma, of, of the building out in Oklahoma City and uh, crash, uh, crashes or service personnel coming home. That's when the church, and in his instance, um, a pastoral uh, image, which is what he represented to me. I always said in my columns, Bill Clinton is one of the finest uh, pastors we've ever had as a minister. You're going to say, oh, but some of the moral act, we're talking about a man's desire to communicate religious uh, depth to people in need. That's when he's a pastor. And the need of our people generally. Uh, we've spoken for many, many years. You've been writing, you edited the Christian Century for many, many years. What do you feel have been the changes in terms of the religious sensitivity, sensibility of the American people? Uh, it's a deeper faith than it used to be. When deeper I first, faith? Yeah, when I first started uh, working over the Christian Century and before that another Methodist magazine, Methodist magazine, that's been over 35 years ago. Uh, I remember a feeling then and trying to write about it then that uh, the American public is hungry for religious uh, answers, for religious dialogue, for religious discussions, for religious answers. But the churches, in the case of my liberal tradition, the churches had become so concerned with solving social problems as well they needed to do, civil rights, the war in Vietnam, uh, the unfairness toward uh, gay people, the uh, lack of fairness for w women, and they fought that battle, but they didn't address sufficiently, they, and I mean this in a general sense for mainline religion, didn't address sufficiently the need for people to grapple with problems such as we've been talking about. We're asking the main questions of who am I and where am I going? What decisions should I make? What happens when I make the wrong decision? Does God forgive me for making these decisions? Uh, am I totally lost because I have stumbled in this regard? And uh, is there a way for me to connect with the ultimate? All of these issues are what, as I say, 35 years ago, I think the um, the public was then and increasingly so, wanting had to deal with those answers. And, and they've received them? Uh, they've received religious structures that allow them to sit with other people and worship God and move in the direction of finding those answers. Yes, I think the religious communities across the board have become better at trying to engage people in dialogue so that their relationship with the ultimate can be expressed and experienced. Yes, I do think that. You make it sound, Jim, I, 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 even as I'm about to say it, I, uh, I know I'll regret my words, but I, I'm at a loss for better words, almost as if it were a, uh, as so many things in our lives have become, a public relations 
effort <laughs> that what has happened has been uh, oh, putting no. a better foot forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, that's you, you not really, what you mean. You, you should regret having. <laughs> no, I don't regret <laughs> it because you'll correct me. You should have regret. You should regret introducing that term. No, it's not a public relations issue. So it is, is it a then? meeting of a need. That's what religion is all about. How do you orient your life? You as an individual, eight-year-old, 12-year-old, 50-year-old, 80-year-old, how do you orient your life to be the most productive, fulfilled individual and the most responsible person in dealing with your fellow human beings and in your obligation to your God? How do you do that? Now, what you're saying, if I understand correctly, is that this is a definition of the role of religion, religion yeah. and that this role has been increasingly filled in this country I, in the I last generation I or two. I think I'm more optimistic about the way in which the institutional religion that we all are familiar with in its various forms have moved into dealing more with the answering these questions. Now, there is the talk about public relation. There is the side of religion that media loves to report on because it's simplistic and absolutist, and that's the religious right in this country, extremists that, that seize upon certain political issues and uh, use them as a way of speaking religion, but in fact, speaking politics. That is not the same thing I'm talking about. They're not grappling with problems. They're trying to sell a bill of uh, goods. Jim, I don't want you to become more critical again of the media, but you must then, logically, you must then be saying, something has taken place, you're aware of it in the past two generations. In a sense, though, it hasn't been reported. Mm -hmm. It is unknown as far as the media are concerned. It's hard to report. For one thing, it's uh, not simplistic. Media is at its best in dealing with simple issues. Win, lose. Sports games are so much better because you know who won, you know who lost. Uh, media is at its best when somebody on either side of an issue will give them an absolutist answer. Yes, up and down on abortion, up and down on gay rights, up and down on other issues like that. But you have so well defined what you mean now. Yeah. I, I'm, you know, I'm always ready to needle you. Yeah. But I'm so impressed by what you say that religious institutions have done, have the job that they've taken on, not that they've abandoned the social gospel, not that they've abandoned fulfilling uh, no, other right. needs but they're doing something that they always should have done. Uh, and they're doing, well, this has been going on a long time. Religious communities have been around for a long time, and they, they rise and fall. I'm just happening to feel right now that we're rising up a little bit in our ability to grapple How with this. How do you this. account for that? I, I would not know. It, it could be um, a, a cyclical matter, a reaction to the lack of this uh, deep probing to religious significance questions. It could be. May I make a theological statement? Uh, it could be the work of the Holy Spirit. It could be that uh, in the strange, mysterious ways, there's a wave of uprising of spiritual uh, hunger that is being addressed. Now, you were asking me earlier, why hasn't the media reported on, on this? Because it's difficult to report on something as nebulous as this is. Very difficult. You can report incidences of it. You can report re you can report on reports of people saying, this has happened to me and I'm better because of that. But that's, an, uh, the media prefers polling. The, if you want to talk about religion and media, you usually end up with a poll. How many people go to church? How many people say they believe in God? And so forth and so on. That, that's not religion. That's just very much an outward uh, measurement. Well, it, it, all of what you're saying is very interesting to me. You think I'm going to look cynically upon what you've said. I know you and you know me, but I, I don't. I'm impressed mm -hmm. by what you say. I'm um, a little puzzled at the fact that some years back you would have said, in answer to my question, why aren't they reporting it? Yeah. Uh, you would have said not, it's so difficult to report, but they're anti. Uh, they basically yeah. don't want to deal yeah, with I, it. I would admit that perhaps I would have said that. They're anti in the sense that they don't want to deal with it because they don't know how to deal with it. I don't know whether that's anti or not. It just means that uh, if, I, if, I, if sitting around a table of an editorial decision of a television program for ABC or a uh, New York Times uh, editorial conference, somebody starts saying, well, how are we going to make this, how are we going to make this newsworthy? 
That's a very hard thing to do, the, these trends. So you get trend stories is what you get, you, you, and that's a good sign. Some religious pages are, are being referred to as trends as well as just religious news. And that can be reported on, but it's usually as an essay. It's usually as an analytical uh, testimony quoting people on these uh, subjects. I've wondered whether issues relating to stem cells, issues mm -hmm. relating to more fundamental manipulation of what it is to be human mm -hmm. isn't going to be a prod to uh, yeah, that's a the tough increasing. One. The stem cell debate is a very tough theological debate. Uh, I, I'm not pleased with the outcome of George Bush's decision on that, and he did give us the indication that he truly studied and, and worried about it, and perhaps he did. I'm not going to deny that. But it is a theological issue at heart, because uh, whether you want to use stem cells it may depend on where you are on the spectrum from left to right politically on the subject of uh, essentially abortion and, and where life begins. Uh, yeah, that could help us. If we take that issue seriously and examine it theologically, I don't know what his commission will do, but if it is made up of people willing to truly ask the serious questions about what can you do in a democratic culture where there are differences of opinion on when life begins, how can you come to grips with something as complex as stem cell uh, research. Do you think, we have 30 seconds left, do you think this is going to provoke an increasing involvement with matters spiritual? I wish it would. I'm afraid it won't because it's such a political issue. It's such, the, the, the parties involved are looking to the next election. Politicians do that. They're looking to the next election. They're not going to have time to argue about uh, the theology of uh, the Catholic vote or the liberal vote. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see this as an opportunity to do that, but maybe something good will come out of it in terms of theological examination. Jim Wall, you've changed. <laughs> and I'm glad still you're the same Jim Wall who comes to this table, and you'll keep coming, I trust, and thank you very much for thank coming you. today. Thank you for having me again. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to the Open Mind P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.